Hey, thanks everybody. Ta da! Yes! Hi everyone, my name is Kent C. Dodds and I am in London. Super excited to be here with you all and talk with you about something I um, have gotten really excited about over the last uh, year or two, and it's progressive enhancement. We're bringing it back. I'm going to talk a little bit about what it is and where it went. Um, so, this is some stuff about me. I'm not going to belabor that too much. The thing I do want to ask you to do, I'm pretty sure we have room. I'd like to invite you all to please stand up. So that's a, a brain emoji. We're going to do something for your brain. This is good um, because we want, to, we want you to have the best chance for success in today's conference. So I want you to put your arms out in front of you like this and squat down and come up. It's called exercise. Uh, so we're, we're going to do 12 of these. I want you to count out loud with me as we go through. Ready? One, two, three, four. You're doing great. Feel free to adjust. Here's modified. That's fine. <laughs> Eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Okay, stretch up over your head as high as you can. Look at the ceiling. What is that? All right, stretch over one side and over to the other. It kind of looks like one of those rain fly things. Is it going to rain? It is London, but we're inside, right? All right, you can sit down. Thank you so much for indulging me. Your brain needs blood to flow, and moving your body gets your blood flowing. So um, if you were at my workshop yesterday, we did that twice. So you got a lot of exercise from Kent C. Dodds. Uh, okay. This talk is a brief explanation of what progressive enhancement means, a demonstration of what it can do for us, both in a UX and a DX, uh, from a UX and DX perspective. And there's a mic drop moment, except I'm wearing the mic, so I might like fall over for that part. We'll see. Um, it's not a time to hate on JS, so those of you who have been doing this for a while and already know what progressive enhancement is. A lot of people will say, progressive enhancement, that means we hate JavaScript, right? No, that's not what this is about. We'll talk about that. So let's start. Um, how many of you have been doing the web for a long time, like a decade? OK, yeah. So um, for a lot of you who have been doing the web for a long time, uh, like PHP and stuff back in the, I mean, a lot of people are still doing that. Um, but uh, building multi-page apps, the web was kind of felt a lot easier than it does today. Something has changed in the last decade to make building web applications really, really tough. And I just want you to think, what was it that changed? What's the difference? And it's not just user requirements and expectations. There is something specific that we have done as developers that have made it a little harder. We're going to answer this question as we go through. So progressive enhancement. Um, the idea behind progressive enhancement is um, you have a baseline of a functional application, and then you use the capabilities of the device to make that experience better. That's the simple definition of progressive enhancement. Um, so an example of this would be if I have a, uh, a pizza uh, franchise and uh, users come to my website and they want to order a pizza, they need to know which um, store they're going to be ordering from. And so they can type in their address to find the one that's closest to them. Or if they have the geolocation API support in the browser, then they can just give permission and I can find the closest one without them having to type it in. Uh, so that, that's an example, a simple example of JavaScript-based progressive enhancement. But progressive enhancement's actually been around for a really long time, uh, introduced in 2003. And the, um, there are a couple of key tenants. I got this just off of uh, Wikipedia. Uh, I'm actually not going to read all these. The ones that I, one I want to um, focus on is enhanced behavior is provided by externally linked JavaScript. So the, basically what that means is JavaScript in it does not enable the experience. It enhances the experience. This is very different. And I want to describe what I mean by that a little bit. So here's the status quo of a lot of web applications we build today. 
Um, what I'm about to show you is a uh, screen uh, cast uh, that I recorded a while ago of YouTube.com. Um, I was using YouTube um, on a bad internet connection, and I experienced this in, in real life. And I was just shocked um, because YouTube has like tons of money, and I feel like they would solve this problem. Um, but what we're going to do is I slow down the network so we can watch this and, and talk about it happening. And then I go to YouTube.com. And the first thing that happens when you go to YouTube.com is first it redirects you to www. Uh, and then um, you're going to load the index HTML for that site that comes from a CDN. This is what it looks like. It is just a big nothing is what it is. And uh, while we're waiting, uh, it's just showing that while we're waiting to download the JavaScript that is necessary for this um, experience to be enabled. Uh, we're downloading a file called desktop polymer that is 1.7 megabytes in size. It is not small. Um, and we're missing the input. So what I'm trying to do is just do a search. So there's no input here until that desktop polymer shows up. And when it does, we're, uh, I can't type in and search. It downloaded just enough JavaScript to prevent default and clear the input. <laughs> Not enough to actually perform the search. Now I'm waiting for base.js, which is another 500 kilobytes of JavaScript, before I can actually perform my search. Um, sorry, I just got to wait, because downloading JavaScript is slow. Uh, <laughs> and it's almost done. There we go. We got it. And now I can finally perform my search. Now, I actually just did this um, to, to make sure that they didn't fix it. You know, I don't want to talk about this if it's a, uh, not a problem anymore. They didn't fix it. They fixed a little bit of it. Uh, so now they actually no longer prevent default. So once that input renders, then you can actually perform the search. But you still have to wait for that. Uh, and yeah, this is, was 1.3 uh, megabytes for desktop polymer when I uh, recorded this. This morning when I tested it, it was 1.7. So that grew bigger. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe they included base.js in that, because it's yeah, that would actually kind of make sense. So oh, what a mess. This is, this is how we experience the web these days. Isn't this bad? Because did you know that a browser doesn't need JavaScript to do that? All, all they need to do is put on their index HTML a little search input box, and then just let the browser do what it does. Because all they're doing is they send you to slash results with a query string, and the browser does that. So when you, we add JavaScript, we actually make the experience worse by default. And we have to like, add back all the stuff that um, we're messing up uh, that the browser does for us. So this is like YouTube is just an example. But your banking website has like 13 spinners on it before you actually see anything. Your uh, kid's school website also has content layout shift all over the place. All of this stuff. And it, it's an unfortunate state of affairs. Now, some of you are thinking, yeah, I can't, that like making things work without JavaScript is awesome, but there are a lot of shortcomings in the browser. How could you build something like Figma without JavaScript? Well, I mean, you could. This is, this is kind of a joke. But uh, Jenna uh, Smith, who is actually here in London, had dinner with her the other night. She's awesome. Built a little uh, test project that uh, basically builds Figma, and there's no client-side JavaScript. Now, OK, basically builds Figma. Figma is very complicated. But there's even in Figma, there's a lot of stuff, like the header, the uh, nav bar, all of that stuff could be um, free of JavaScript. Not, it doesn't all have to be enabled by JavaScript. And there's a lot of really awesome things that you get when you focus on progressive enhancement. So um, I am a co-founder of Remix. I'm no longer at the company. I don't have any Shopify stock or any Shop Shopify acquired Remix. I don't have any stock in the company, anything like that. I've just been using Remix for two and a half years, and I love it a lot. And we're going to be talking about Remix and using some examples, because this is one of the pillars of Remix is progressive enhancement. It's why I got so excited about it. Also, Jenna, she got me excited about it, too. Um, OK, remember to, to do MVC, any of you? All right, so to do MVC showed up, uh, I actually should have checked, but around like uh, maybe eight years ago. Um, and that was around the time we kicked progressive enhancement to the curb and said, you know what, all of this stuff is really too complicated. Let's just do everything in the browser. Um, and so to do MVC, the project was just to allow you to compare different ways of building client side apps with different frameworks. And so I rebuilt to do MVC using Remix um, and um, Couple of interesting facts about it. So I actually added persistence uh, in the back end. Normally, to do MVC persists your to dos in local storage. Um, it, so it's server rendered as well. 
um, there's user authentication, and it's progressively enhanced, and it even with all of those extra things that it didn't, um, the regular to-do MVC doesn't have, I still have 15% of the client-side JavaScript uh, to the comparable uh, React implementation of, um, of to-do MVC. So that's pretty cool. I also have this. So this is a test that was done in, uh, on a low-end device in India for both of these. Um, the, uh, my app is being hosted in uh, like Virginia, I think, and, or maybe like Texas. So both of these are, are going from India to wherever the CDN for to do MVC is and, and um, where my app is running, and I'm twice as fast. Despite the fact that uh, um, they, they probably have a global CDN. And a lot of that just comes from the fact that um, we're server rendering this, because there's a whole waterfall problem when you use JavaScript to enable the experience. So progressive enhancement makes the user experience better, but it does a lot more than just the user experience. I want to prove it to you. So um, in this app, JS does not enable the experience. The whole thing works without JavaScript. Um, you can see I, all the JavaScript files are blocked there. Uh, that's a feature in the browser. You can disable JavaScript. Um, and so, yeah, I can submit new uh, to-do items, I can check them off, I can do all of that stuff without JavaScript. So that's cool. Um, and that works because the browser knows how to mutate stuff. All, everything in there is a form. Even the checkboxes, that's a form. It's just a submit button. And uh, when I check one of those off, then I ha uh, have the to-do ID, the uh, new state that I want to set that to-do to, -do to and uh, what I want to actually perform. And that comes from this form. So this is the, the toggle um, form that's submitted. And the post on the form there is what says, I want to serialize the contents of this form to uh, form data as part of the request that's going to be made that the browser does for us. Um, and because I don't want the user to have to type in the input uh, or in the ID for the to-do, um, I have a hidden input. Those of you who have been around for a long time, you're like, yeah, this is the way we used to do it. I remember that. Um, and those of you who have not been around for a while, you're like, what the devil? Um, but yeah, that's, that's declarative um, uh, forms. It's really actually quite cool. You don't have to use state and you know, fetch with JSON or whatever. You just stick it in the form. Um, we also have a hidden input for the state that we want it to be when it's clicked. So when the form is submitted, we say, hey, this is the state I want it to be. Um, and then here's a fun little thing that I learned uh, recently. Buttons can also have name and values. And so you could actually have multiple submit buttons for a single form and then have them all have the same name and the value would be whichever one the user clicked on. So that's cool. You can have like a delete uh, as part of this form and, and so now you can determine, okay, what action do they actually want to perform here? So that's how I implemented that. And the browser knows how to do all that. So I want to ask the question again, why was web dev so much easier before? What is it about modern web dev that made building web apps so hard? What changed? So to answer that question, I'm going to ask you another one. What state management library am I using? Am I using Redux, Apollo, MobX, the something I made up, context? The, it's a trick question. There's none. There can't be. I can't be using a state management library because I'm not loading JavaScript. So my, my Redux store is the database. I don't have to because the way that the web works is you submit a form and it does a full page refresh and it gets all fresh stuff. Everything on the page is fresh after that form submission is finished. And so I, don't, I can't use a state management library when I, uh, because if I care about progressive enhancement. Now, of course, like, it is possible. You can use Apollo and you can use Redux and, and whatever else you want to use, uh, React Query. You can use those things, but if you care about progressive enhancement, they're not allowed. I mean, like you could enhance with those things, but I'm not sure why you would do that because the functionality you get is actually pretty good. So this is the answer to the question. Why was it so much easier before? It's because the mental model was easier because you didn't have to worry about state management. The multi-page app mental model, way, way better than the spa mental model because it's just like user submits form, user gets new page. Whereas the spa is like, user submits form, I find all of the affected data, and I go and update all that affected data and update the, the DOM and stuff. Now, luckily, we have something like uh, React, and so updating the DOM is actually not the tricky part. No, we just have to update state, and then the, the DOM will update. But just update state. There are 3,300 results on NPM when you search for state management. 
I, d I don't know. It seems to me that if there are that many packages trying to solve the problem, the problem is probably kind of hard. I would submit that probably 30 to 50% of your time and code and bugs revolve around state management uh, as UI developers. So we like the MPA mental model. But the problem is we don't like the MPA experience. Full page refreshes? Are you kidding me? Can you imagine if every time you favorited a tweet, you got a full page refresh? How many tweets would you favorite? Like none, because that would be the worst. Or, or should I say toots? Sorry. Um, so spot capabilities are way better. We are way more capable with spot. Um, and what Remix does is it takes the MPA mental model and combines it with the SPA capabilities. And so I'm going to uh, give you some examples. Uh, I'm actually running kind of low on time, so we're going to uh, speed up a little bit. Um, but here's my mic drop moment. There's no application state management with Remix, even if you're building Figma. No application state management. Now, there is, of course, you're going to have, like, the dropdown is open, or you know, the modal is closed, or whatever. There's local component state that you have to deal with, but that stuff's not, uh, not nearly as complicated as the application state management. That's not where the bugs live. So it's in the application state management. So there you go. I didn't want to drop the real mic, because they'd probably get mad at me. So let's talk about uh, what happens when we bring JavaScript in. When uh, you submit a form in the browser, you get some pending UI. That's just built in um, with the browser. So if you don't have JavaScript, uh, you submit a form, uh, you get a Fabicon spinner. That's cool. When you add JavaScript and say prevent default, you don't get that anymore. You're doing a fetch request now. There's no API into the browser. Actually, I think that there might be one coming, but not one right now that allows you to say, hey, Favicon, I want you to be spinning. You could like, maybe change the Favicon to a, an animated thing, but no, nobody does that. Um, it's not built in. So when you, as soon as you say prevent default on a form submission or a link click, you have unenhanced the experience. You've made the experience worse because the user doesn't get feedback. Now, if your app is crazy fast, then maybe it's fine, but guess what? You don't get to control how fast the user's network is. So we're making the experience worse. So you have to think about, how do I make the experience better? If I'm going to bring on JavaScript, I better make the experience better than it would be without that. So here's the component that's responsible for the checkbox, uh, or, or for that whole list item. And um, the, we ha in Remix, we have these things called fetchers. And those fetchers are used to render forms and do uh, mutations. So um, for our toggle button, we have this toggle fetcher form. So if I wanted to add some sort of pending UI, my designer said, hey, just disable the input, and I'll, I have some styles that, that will uh, make it look like it's pending. I say, great. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, hey, if the toggle fetcher is currently submitting, if there's a submission associated to it, then I know it's toggling. And now I can add a disabled on uh, the checkbox. I'll also, uh, the product said they don't want me to change the, the contents or anything either. So I'll disable the um, uh, edit, and I'll disable the delete as well. And so with that, now I've actually made the experience better. So instead of having a favicon spinner, I get a contextual inline experience. This is something you, you d can't do without client-side JavaScript. We have enhanced the experience. Baseline of a functional app, so if the JavaScript takes a long time to load or for some reason doesn't, the app still works, but we make the experience better by adding JavaScript, because it is definitely a better experience this way. And in this app, there's no use state, there's no use effect, no use reducer, because I focused on progressive enhancement. So I, I should caveat that I didn't write any use state, use effect, or use reducer. There, of course, it's a React implementation, there's going to be all of those things. But the point is, Remix is my browser emulator. And it allows me to just think or feel like I'm just building an, a multi-page app. And then I can uh, um, use the hooks that it provides for me so I know what's going on and, and uh, can give that progressively enhanced experience. So uh, I want to talk about Optimist UI. This is a quick example. I create a tweet. And then I'm going to open that up in another tab. And I'm going to favorite it. But first, I'm going to slow down the network. You notice it, it favorites instantly, even then, though the network is slow. And then um, I, like the question I want to ask you is, how is it doing that? Why, why does it do that? Then I go delete it, and I come back, and I try to unfavorite it. And it, it immediately unfavorites. But then it favorites again without me doing anything. And that's because the tweet was deleted. So you can never unfavorite a deleted tweet. So if you want to you know, make sure people can't unfavorite your stuff, just delete it. Um, so that's. 
this is what we call optimistic UI. It's a pretty common pattern, but not as common as it should be, um, because it's actually very difficult to handle that, uh, that case where things break. Uh, like, oh, this is, my optimism was misplaced. Things are not the way that I, uh, I was hoping they would be. But Twitter has decided, you know what, like 99% of the time this favorite's going to work, so we'll just show it right away. And then they have to implement the rollback. And the rollback is why we don't see it as often, because it's actually pretty hard uh, to, to think about um, and make sure we're rolling back properly, unless you're using Remix. So let's talk about that. The, 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 this is another piece of progressive enhancement you can't do without JavaScript. So we've got um, an input here that says what our next state should be for this toggle. And so I'm going to say, instead of referencing the complete value based off of what came from the database, I'm going to actually say, hey, that submission that is currently happening, they submitted this form. They're going to have the com what the next state is going to be. So if they're submitting something, I will take that and use that as what the state um, I display should be. Um, if they're not submitting, then I'll just use what came from the database. So that's the idea, um, and I'm done. That's, that's optimistic UI and Remix. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah. So uh, now, even with a slow network connection, I feel like, uh, like I'm right there, right? Like it's running on my machine. It's just, it feels really awesome. And at the end of the day, Remix is doing all of these requests in the background, and it just makes it work. Remix is my browser emulator, and I can then just add a little piece of, of JavaScript here and there to make the experience better. But again, like what, what about uh, rollback? What happens if there's a failure of some kind, like some loser just put this in there? That would be a weird thing to do. Don't do that. OK, so rollback just happens automatically, just by nature of the way that Remix emulates the browser. Because it, it, if we didn't have um, the client-side JavaScript in our app, then what would happen is we'd get a, a form submission, a full page refresh, and when the full page refresh comes back, that to do was not checked. And so uh, when we get it back, it, it's actually in its correct state. So Remix emulates the browser and does exactly the same thing. When you check this off, it's going to go, uh, and, and when it fails, it's going to go and revalidate to make sure that all the, the data on the page is correct. And so we never end up in the incorrect state. And we don't, we don't have to think about it. That one line right there that I showed you, that was it. That's all I had to do. Now, it's not always that easy. Sometimes things can be a little complicated, but um, it normally is um, about that easy. And so I added a bunch of um, optimistic UI, even uh, displaying the error. If you type the word error, then um, it's going to tell you you can't do that. And uh, it feels like a super fast app. And you'll see there are a couple of those requests are failing. Um, and that's actually not failed requests. Um, that is when um, uh, Remix actually cancels a request because it knows what's coming back from that doesn't matter because I'm going to get new data anyway. So Remix manages for me submissions and race conditions and all of that stuff for you. It's brilliant. So I'm done. Just have a couple things I want to say. Progressive enhancement is about accessibility. You want to make the baseline is functional. I'm sick and tired of content layout shift all over the place and waiting for JavaScript to download. And so are your users. Even, even like, oh, my app is behind a login screen, and people are paying like $6 million a year to use it anyway, so it's not like they're not going to use it. I don't need it to be fast. Well, I'll tell you what, that executive that's paying for that, that app is on a slow network in like China at a conference, and they are not happy looking at a white screen while they're waiting for all your obnoxious JavaScript to load. So please, it, even in those situations, they, they do care. It does matter. And uh, Remix enables progressive enhancement by emulating the browser. And it, it makes the development experience better. So even if you don't care about your users, do you care about yourself? Like, treat yourself. Progressive enhancement makes your life easier. Uh, Remix simplifies DX and improves UX by merging the multi-page app um, develop, or, or uh, mental model with the spot capabilities. And what we call this is, or what I call this, is a PESPA, Progressively Enhanced Single Page Apps. And I have a big, long article. You can read about um, that later. Um, so working it without JavaScript isn't just about develop, uh, uh, UX. It's just as much about DX. And it's great. I've been working with it for two and a half years. It is my favorite, obviously. You're brilliant. Thank you so much.